Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So today's Srimad Bhagavatam is ninth canto, ninth chapter. Text number 43, and it's the dynasty of Amus, Amsuman. Text number 43. Name Brahma Kula Prana Kula Daivam Najat Majaha Nastriyo Ma Nastriyo Nama Hirajyam Nadarsa Nadaras Chat Valabaha Nami Brahma Kula Pranha Kula Daivam Nachat Majaha Nastriyo Nama Hirajyan Nadaras Chatti Valabaha Nami Brahma Kula Pranha Kula Daivam Nachat Majaha Nastriyo Ma Mahirajan Nadaras Chatti Valabaha Then the group of Brahmanas, Prana, life, Kula Daivat. Then the personalities worshipable for my family, Na, Nat, Cha, also Atmajaha, sons and daughters. Na, nor, Shriya, opulence, Na, nor, Mahi, the earth, Rajyam, kingdom, Na, nor, Dara, wife, Cha, also, Attivallabaha, extremely dear. 
Translation purport by His Divine Grace, A. C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shirabhupad Ki. Hmm. Maharaj Kadvanga thought, now, even my, not even my life is dearer to me than the Brahminical culture and the Brahmanas, who are worshipped by my family. What then is to be said of my kingdom, land, wife, children, and opulence? Nothing is dearer to me than the Brahmanas. Hmm. Purport. Maharaj Kadvanga, being in favor of the Brahminical culture, wanted to utilize one moment's time by fully surrendering unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord is worshipped with this prayer. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanya Hitaya Chan Jagaditaya Krishnaya Go Vindaya Namo Namaha I offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Lord Absolute Truth. Krishna, who is the well-wisher of the cows and the brahmanas, as well as the living entities in general. I offer my repeated obeisances to Govinda, who is the pleasure reservoir of all the senses. We chant it. When do we chant this mantra? We chant it every day, don't we? When? What, who knows when we chant this mantra? Yeah, when would be when we offer foodstuffs to the Lord? We chant this we chant Prabhupada's pranams, then we chant Lord Chaitanya's, the prayer glorifying Lord Chaitanya by Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, and then this prayer here. I'm not sure where it's from, but it's a beautiful prayer. A devotee of Krishna is very much attached to Brahminical culture. Indeed, an expert personality who knows who Krishna is and what, and what he is Oh, sorry. A devotee of Krishna is very much attached to the Brahminical culture. Indeed, an expert personality who knows who Krishna is and what he wants is a real Brahmana. Brahma Janatiti Brahmanaha. Krishna is the Param Brahman, and therefore all Krishna conscious persons or devotees of Krishna are exalted Brahmanas. Kadvanga Maharaj regarded the devotees of Krishna as the real Brahmanas and the real light for human society. One who desires to advance in Krishna consciousness and spiritual understanding must give the utmost importance to Brahminical culture and must understand Krishna. Krishnaya Govindaya. Then his life will be successful. Om Ajnan Timidandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manovi Stam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Bande Ham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padikamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Draganatam Tam Vitam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneswari Prikabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pebhacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaho Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pasyatya Dezatari Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gauda Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare 
in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in the later chapters, <clears throat> I believe it's around chapter 17 or 18, Prabhupada mentions uh, what is the perfect human society and what are the activities of the perfect human society. And he mentions three. One of them is mentioned here. Actually, two is mentioned here. And that is worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the establishment of Brahminical culture, and cow protection. <laughs> These are the three things that make up a, what we say, a progressive human society. <laughs> uh, keeping our focus on the goal of life, worshiping the Lord, having the tools to worship the Lord and practicing those principles that make society progressive and pleasant, that is called Brahminical culture. And of course, the cow is the economic base within the society. It provides everything one needs for what we say subsistence, both materially and spiritually, just like the cow. We use uh, cow dung, cow urine uh, for worship, panchagavya, it's called, the five substances from the cow, cow dung, cow urine, milk, ghee, and what else, huh? yogurt, milk, ghee, and yogurt. So those five things we do, we actually pour them on the deities themselves, so how sacred and special the cow is. And then we have Brahminical culture, that culture that is directed by God consciousness. <laughs> uh, that culture that is progressive, what is that Brahminical culture? To develop good qualities. What are those qualities? To be tolerant, to be patient, to be free from the dualities of anxiety and lamentation. To be peaceful, be equi equipoised, to know scriptures, to be able to apply the scripture knowledge in day-to-day -day life, to and worship the Lord in his form of his deity, and of course, we chant the holy names of the Lord. Now these are some of the qualities that make up and Society needs, needs to be guided by these cult, these principles. Society is led by the Kshatriyas. The Kshatriyas are the ones who are administrators. What are the, what are the categories of Kshatriyas? Protection, administration, and welfare. We say PAW, P-A-W. <laughs> Protection of the citizens against enemies from the outside. Be able to administrate the affairs of the state and at the same time see to the welfare of all the citizens. And this is the duty of the Kshatriyas, these three, because Bhagavad Gita describes them in more detail. One of the actual characteristics of, the, of a person who has those, who is in that position. So, but the, still, the Kshatriyas have this mood of <clears throat> of getting things done. <laughs> the Kshatriyas have to get things done, but the Brahmins don't have to get things done. They have to direct things in the right way so things get done. <laughs> so what is that? And that direction is spiritual guidance. <laughs> so when the Kshatriyas are guided by the Brahmins, and then you have the perfect society and the Vaishyas provide the economic base by protecting cows, developing agriculture and the, what we say, the pecuniary activities of society, which needs, that means people have to trade and do business, various things. And then the Sutra class, those who don't have any of those three categories of activities, they support the other varnas, and they also provide for arts and crafts within society. Like that. So that's a perfect Brahminical society. Brahminical means led by the Brahmins, along with the rest of the varnas, not just everybody's a Brahmin. <laughs> 
And not, if everybody's a Brahmin, nothing gets done, right? Because <laughs> the Brahmins, they just sit around and talk about what everybody else should do, right? <laughs> No, and of course they worship the deity too. But on the material level you have to have functions. So therefore the Kshatriya is directed and the devices also provide the means for it to carry it out along with the sudras. So this is a perfect society. Vana, vana and ashrama, both like that. So without Brahminical society, a Brahminic culture which governs society, the society is like a headless body. And we see, in today's world, what do we see? We see people who are in power, positions of power, who, ne who neither have qualities of Kshatriya nor are led by spiritual principles. <laughs> they don't take advice from religious or saintly persons, nor do they have the mood of a proper Kshatriya. They're more like businessmen. That's, that's giving them a pretty good rating. I mean, our present day president, he's, he was an expert businessman, ruthless, very ruthless. Now he governs in the same way. <laughs> my, my way or the highway. But that's terrible politics. <laughs> I don't want to criticize the present administration, but anyway. The point is that um, we see that the leaders around the world are either, you know, very much avaricious for material gains, can't give protections to the citizens and exploit the citizens for an excess amount of taxes and various types of services and give hardly anything back. You can't walk the streets at night because there's no protection. There's thieves, rogues, and so many people running around who are out there ready to, you know, commit crimes against people. No, there's no kshatriyas to really quell that type of, you know, society. Because they're like that themselves. <laughs> they're like that themselves. So you see, society is topsy-turvy. No one's happy. Because there's no leadership, there's no administration, there's no proper rule. Everything is centered around economics, mm -hmm. in a term... Just in the business way, you just buy more and more and more and you work hard and hard and hard and you can have as much sense gratification as you want and even more than that. So the whole society is a, as Prabhupada said, it's a, what does he say? He said many things, but he said it's basically a society with no direction. <laughs> People have no direction in life. And you know, see, people wonder, well, how can I be happy in today's world? And they're always faced with the, you know, uh, you just buy this, and you just be like this person who has a good position, has big cars, has nice houses, has many, you know, much money. And that's success, right? That's success, right? And that's what people are hearing all the time. And they work so hard and make a lot of money, and then the economic situation is that the business are always trying to take your money. <laughs> you have one thing, and they want to sell you the same thing that's a little bit better. <laughs> right? You got one computer, but you got to have the latest model. <laughs> you got one pair of clothes, but you have, have to have something that's more fashionable. You have you have one type type of uh, car, but you you know you need another one because it's just not up to the standard after a little while. So it's just constantly being thrown at you know, and people the advertising business they actually study people's uh, buying habits, and then they bombard you with all kinds of advertisement based on how you buy. They study that twenty four seven. So what is the idea? Get your money. <laughs> That's all. Somehow get your money by useless products. You, they, you think they're useful. I mean, and then people get this idea that I have to keep up to a certain standard of life or else I'm going to be considered to be unsuccessful in life. So everybody's rushing to keep the higher standard. And the higher standard gets higher. <laughs> and nobody makes it, right? You get a new Lexus, you're so happy, but after a few years, 
you know, your, the happiness that you experience you know, having your new car goes down. Because after a while, you know, that whole feeling of immediate satisfaction and gratification wears off. And then all it is is your car anymore. And then, you, then they tell you, you need another car. <laughs> Here, have a better Lexus or better BMW or whatever you... <laughs> so this is society. Society just keeps throwing material things at you and you have to enjoy as much as possible. If you don't gratify your senses, you cannot be happy. Right? But what does the Bhagavad Gita say? Yehi sam sparsa ja boga, dukkha yonia evite, avanta vanta kunte, anateshu ramate buddha. That sense gratification is the source of suffering. The more one tries to enjoy their senses, the more they suffer. <laughs> it's just the way the things are set up. Um, human nature works in such a way as if you, whatever your happiness you get by sense enjoyment, you get a concomitant equal amount of what we say suffering. And what is the greatest form of happiness? Sex life. At least that's what they say. And then, so what is the greatest form of suffering? That comes by way of that process of sex life in different forms. Well, you can see. So no one is happy and everyone is struggling to find some kind of happiness and satisfaction. So Brahminical culture is actually human culture. And therefore Prabhupada says, this is what needs to be established in order to bring society back to the right direction in life. And Brahminical culture teaches the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the goal of life, <laughs> as the goal of life. So this system of vana and ashrama is required. And Prabhupada, 1974, um, before then, when he first started the movement and up to 1974, he was talking that vana ashram is not possible in this age. Everything is so topsy-turvy. You just chant the holy names of the Lord and then you engage in devotional service. But in 1974, he made an adjustment to, uh, to that type of preaching. He said, now we have to establish Van Arsha. Um, in March 14th, 1974, in Vrindavan, he gave a one-hour class. It was a morning walk class with some leading sannyasis at the time, explaining how to establish the Van Arsha. But he didn't want just material Van Arsha. There's perverted Varnashram, there's material Varnashram, we call it corrupted Varnashram. Co corrupted Varnashram is, you're born in a Brahmin family, you're a Brahmin. You're born in a Kshatriya family, you're a Brahmin. Simply by birth, by Janma, not by Karma. <laughs> but actual culture means to develop the qualities. So you see, this is called perverted, they call it the caste system. The whole downfall of, of India is the downfall of the caste system. When the Brahmins were somewhat in, in what we say, when leading in society, and they exploited the other castes. If you're not born in a Brahmin family, you're considered to be a lower class. And therefore you cannot worship. <laughs> Only the Brahmins can worship. And then, of course, what happened, Prabhupada tells the story, how when the Islamic rulers came and invaded India and took over various positions, now, one very nefarious ruler was Arunzab. So he was a terrorist. And what he did is that anyone, anyone who was a Hindu had to pay a tax. And if you were a Muslim, there was no tax. So for the people who were poor, they couldn't pay the tax, and so they be, they changed and become Muslim, and they were free from the taxes. And that way, he could create, what we say, brought more and more people to Islam in that way. And at the same time, the Brahmins were saying that anyone who's born in a lower family, even if we see them, we have to, you know, uh, our whole day is polluted, and you can't even see a sutra. Right? So they would say, 
uh, if a suitor would come to the door, they would immediately chase them away, and then they would wash their whole house with cow dung like that. <laughs> So this was going on in the name of Brahminical culture, and, and uh, gradually, because of that, the whole society started to grow. The downfall of India is the downfall of the Brahminical culture, and that's carried all the way through uh, in society. And so, but Prabhupada in 1974 said, now we have to establish Varna and Ashram. And what did he say? He said, Daiviva and Ashram. That we need a class of persons who are Brahmins, a class of persons who are Kshatriyas, a class of persons who are Vaishnavas. Sudras don't need training. And so he wanted to establish what is called Vanashram College. And that throughout the society there will be a college in many places around the movement. And there will be Brahmins to teach the three, the three Varnas, Brahminical culture, Vaishnava, uh, Vaishnava, not Vaishnava, but Vaishya activities and Kshatri administration, like that. And he said, then, then we can organize our society in such a way that everyone will be nicely engaged according to their nature. Everyone will be gay. And he says, when you're engaged according to your nature, you become creative in the expression of your service. And at the same time, you become very happy and you offer wonderful service. And that's, that requires two things, education and at the same time, practical training like that. So one of the, was actually Ridai Nanda Maharaj, he's listening to Prabhupada and he's asking a lot of questions about this in, in this discussion. And Prabhupada said, you know, the Brahmins should teach all the other uh, Varnas their particular activities. And then he says, does that mean every Brahmin has to know every other activity? Prabhupada said, no. But the Brahmins in collectively should know all the activities. So some people can teach, you know, how to administrate. Others can teach how to fight. Others can teach how to protect cows. Others can teach how to do commerce and banking, like that. So Prabhupada said, this is the future of our society. Unless we establish this Daivi Van Ashram, well, it will be very hard to keep our society progressive like that. And so, in 1977, Prabhupada said some direct statements saying that now we must do this, otherwise our society will not grow like that. And people, when material society falls apart, they will have no alternative. You can engage people in spiritual life, but still they have to have some kind of training and proper occupation. Otherwise, people will go away. And they'll, they'll put more emphasis on Varna, and because they cannot find Varna within the, the, the Vaishnava culture, they will go outside and simply work like an ass, <laughs> for money. <laughs> and therefore, we, our society, well, you see, devotees come, they stay for a little while, they go. They come, they stay for a little while, they go, because they're not properly engaged. We need education and evaluation. Evaluation is the principle that establishes proper education. How to evaluate, to look at a particular person, and say, what is their nature and how to use that nature in the service of the Lord through both education and training. And then people will stay because they're nicely engaged. Most of the day we are doing activities. We worship in the morning, we worship in the evening. So the most important part of the day is our service. So you have to like your service. <laughs> well, sometimes we say, well, just serve and you'll like it. We try that. <laughs> It, it works for in some cases, but not in all cases. Not in all cases. And so this Vana, Daivi Vanarsham. Now, when it's not about Vanarsham, it's Daivi. Daivi means spiritual. We are not Brahmins. We are not Kshatriyas. We are not Sudras. We are not Vaishyas. Gopi Bhatta Padaka Malayor Dasa Dasa Anudas. Lord Chaitanya says, I'm not a Brahmin. I'm not a Kshatriya. I'm not a Vaishya. I'm not a Sudra. I'm not a brahmacharya, I'm not a sannyasi, I'm not a grihasta, I'm not a vanaprasa. What am I? 
Gopig Bhartar Pade Kamalayor Das Das I'm servant of the servant of the servant of the damsels of Raj. In other words, our real and only identity now this is I'll say it again, our real and our own identity, and we are servant of the Supreme Lord. That's our only identity. But we have to play these roles in the material world in order to carry on the functions. Otherwise, without the foundation, the spiritual practice becomes challenged, and sometimes it falls apart. Many times it does. So, this is the future of our movement. We're trying to establish this Vanarshram. But Prabhupada says, Brahminical culture, which is Vanarshram, um, cow protection, which is also included within Vanarshram, and worship of the Supreme Personality of God, it makes up the perfect society. Everything, all of these three things, when combined together, it's, it's progressive society. You might say, well, how do we do it in today's world? It looks so impossible. Everything is topsy-turvy. People are fighting. People don't even know which direction in life to take. Society is all upside. Even within our, how do we do it? Starts with training. Starts with training and education. Education in the varnas, education in the ashramas, like that. Just like there's one place in, I won't say where, <laughs> in the world that there, it's a temple and there's many pujaris there. Now the pujaris are not brahmins, they're mostly kshatriyas. <laughs> so you know what happens when kshatriyas get together? They never agree on anything. You have to give Kshatriya their territory to rule, and then he has his little place and he rules. And he gets along with other Kshatriyas because they all do their little areas of rule. Kshatriya has to be in charge. He can't work under anybody. Brahmins can't work under anybody either. <laughs> Prabhupada used to say, uh, Brahmins are, what is that? What is that? There's four... Vaishas are capitalists, sutras are communists, um, kshatriyas are, what is it, monarchy, and brahmins are anarchy. <laughs> yeah. Brahmins are anarchy, kshatriyas are monarchy, vaishas are capitalist, and sutras are communists. Like that, you can even attack the the uh, the uh, different types of political systems. You can see the mood. That's the ideal, of course, like that. So when you have you know you have kshatriyas doing brahminical work, they just fight. That's all. <laughs> they disagree. They don't fight, but they disagree in it because they all want to be in control. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It's a certain nature. You can't take, can't change that nature. You direct that nature. When we try to change a person's nature, we create an, what we say, an oxymoron, a situation where a purple person cannot function properly. So the idea is to, now on the highest platform, when a person is developed pure devotional service, he can do any, any service. He's not bothered by what his nature, he's transcended his swadharma. Swadharma means your material nature. But until society gets to that standard, we have to educate people and train them according to their nature. And Prabhupada writes in the first canto, it is the duty of the, of the, the spiritual masters to see their disciples and engage them according to their nature in devotional service. He writes that it's in the first canto, I believe it's in the eighth chapter. So, and until we develop that, our society will not progress. We will have, we'll just keep doing, we'll do whatever we do, and the people will come and people will go like that. But to keep people, you need this. And also to, an edit, to bring materialistic people to spiritual life is also needed because when people come out of some frustration to the material life, then the first thing Prabhupada said is Varna, it's not ashram. You engage them accordingly, and then as they become engaged, then you gradually teach them Krishna consciousness.
like that. We gradually teach Krishna consciousness. So it's a whole scientific system of establishing the, uh, the Brahminical culture along with worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the economic basis, the cow. You might think, well, what can a cow do? Well, a cow can do everything. <laughs> the bull and the cow is sufficient for economics. Everything is there. You can, if you explore what the cow can give, you can find that it can do anything. It can even, I've seen this most amazing thing. I was in India in a place called, where's our farm? It's a farm community in um, Belgaum, in Belgaum, which is Kanaka, Canada, Canada, Canada. Anyway, they, they had a clock and they had two leads, two electrical leads coming off the clock into a, a cup that had cow dung and cow urine in the cup. And the leads were in the cup and it was moving the clock. <laughs> I saw it. That's not just something I heard. I saw it. So you, 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 the, the magic of cow dung and cow urine can be used in so many ways. The devotees have thought of 60 ways to use cow dung and cow urine in Belga in different ways. And you can make houses, you can cook, you can, uh, you can heat by making methane gas from cow dung. And just you need a little bit of machinery to do that, but um, but it can be done. So the cow and the bull are very, very they're the basis of economic society. Not just the cow, but the bull also plows the field. But you might say, well, how can we develop an agrarian society now? Well, that because unless we have food, you look at today's society, right? Um, they're just destroying the farms and making these factory farms where they bring these big, big metropolises into farms now. They make these gigantic farms that are all mechanized. And, then, and they're all paid workers. They're not farmers. <laughs> they're not actually, they're farmers who are paid workers, that's all. And they're trying, they're very trying hard to control the whole food supply in the world. They don't want anybody com com making their own food because they want to control everyone that way. Through the, through, if you can control the food, you can control people pretty, pretty strongly like that. And you need food, you have to come to us. And if you're not a good person, then we cut you off for whatever reason like that. So you see these two powerful uh, companies, Monsanto and Cargill, mm -hmm. and there's a few other ones like that, with GMO, like that, spreading this, these false vegetables. They look good from the outside, but they're not very healthy. I've done a little study on this, and many people have died from eating this stuff, mm -hmm. because in many places it actually causes cancer. So we live in a very dysfunctional society, and it's only not only dysfunctional; it's it's getting worse and worse. Right. And you see, economic uncertainty and you know war is just looming over the world right now, and people are, don't know any direction. I met one lady just the other day when we went to see this film of. Hare Krishna, the mantra, the, the mission, and the man, and the, and the Swami who started. And she was saying, the world is terrible nowadays. She was a Jewish lady, very intelligent, and she was about 60 years old. She said that the world is so horrible. <laughs> she said, I'm looking for something. <laughs> and she came just to, to check out, you know, Hare Krishna through this film. And we gave her... I uh, gave her a card and the address to the temple. So she asked, where is the temple? So this is an average person who lives in the world and they can, and they all people can see things are quite crazy. People are good by nature, but the leaders are destroying people's good qualities. Mm -hmm. 
people's good qualities are being destroyed by their society. <laughs> and so, um, Prabhupada's mission was to establish Krishna consciousness worldwide. Prabhupada was not satisfied with just having more, another religion amongst so many other religions. This is not our process. Our process is to make this the world direct people, because this is what Krishna wants. This Brahminical culture is actually human society. And these four varnas and ashrams. And Krishna says, Chaturvarna Mayasrista Guna Karma Vibhagasaha. These four varnas and four ashrams were established by me. I am the author of this system, but at the same time, I'm outside the system. So this is what Krishna is saying this in the Bhagavad Gita. So here we see, and Prabhupada mentions two things here. He doesn't talk about cow protection, but actually cow protection is included in Brahminical culture. Like that. Wherever you see cows protected, the cows are happy. Just like the milk you buy nowadays is terrible. It's all polluted and it's all pasteurized and watered down. But actual cow's milk coming from protected cows is actually a complete different substance than the, than the stuff that you buy in it. It's completely different. That's why people don't want milk. They say milk's unhealthy. But actually it's not when it's actually real milk. <laughs> and therefore Prabhupada wanted our farms where we can have protected cows. Cows that are being taken care of by devotees. Not just cows that are being taken care of by non-devotees, even though they're, they're milk cows, no. Because when they're, they know, the cows know that they're being cared for properly and they're happy. And when the cows are happy, they give good milk, healthy milk. When a cow is unhappy, Although it gives milk, it secretes this fearful, because it's feeling fear, a certain enzyme of fear comes into the milk and pollutes the milk. The cow knows. The cow is very sensitive. They know if they're going to be taken care of properly, or they are taken care of, or they're going to be killed. They know that. And so if they're free, free from fear, they give wonderful milk. And the Indian cows, they give a kind of milk which has, which is called A2 enzyme. And that A2 enzyme you can't find in Western cows, although there's a few of them. And that is the highest form of milk. It's mostly all Indian cows. There's a few of those cows in America. We met one when we were in Charlotte, remember? One devotee. When we went that that little farm. No, Charlotte. Oh, was it Toronto? No. The A2 cow, yeah. Was that Toronto? Oh yeah, that's right, it was Toronto. I forgot. You sure? <laughs> they didn't come to that place. They weren't there. The program we had that night, that boy, that young boy, who was a former brahmachari, he got married, and we went to the we went to the flute song farm. That was in Hillsboro, yeah, North Carolina, yeah. There was some A2 cows there. Yeah, so those are the best cows. That milk is like full of nutrition and whatever you need. And people complain about the milk today and you have such a large vegan movement. Why? Because the milk is bad. They have a, they have a, and because the cows are being killed, they have a, you know, what was the word? They have a point, a very strong point. But to throw out milk altogether is not the answer. It's to protect cows and take and bring them, you know, in the proper consciousness. And so, the, therefore, Prabhupada said, milk is the miracle food for old men and 
babies. <laughs> It nourishes finer brain tissue. When the brain tissues are nourished, one can practice Krishna consciousness easier. Like that. So this vegan is not a solution to the problem, although it helps to prevent for the problem from getting worse. Like that. So yeah, we want to take care of cows. And we, many of our devotees around the world have established in cow protection. It's growing more and more. So that's part of Raminical culture and to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead according to the system given by the Acharyas and the present previous spiritual master. Then Prabhupada says, Krishnaya Govindaya, then one's life will become successful. So what are we doing now? We're struggling to practice Krishna conscious. It's hard because we don't have the ideal situation. But because but if we take shelter of the holy name of the Lord and engage nicely in devotional service, we can become free from the influence of this, what we say, soul-killing society that is always throwing things at you in the wrong way. <laughs> We have to keep, we have to be strong in our sadhana. If we're not strong in sadhana, not just sadhana, but strong sadhana, we will not be able to stay fixed in Krishna consciousness. And we have, that's where, see that sign that's behind me? What does it say? Prabhupada, that sign behind me. I put that sign up. <laughs> that's why I know what it says. <laughs> No, that doesn't say 16 rounds. What does it say? There you go. What does it say? Read it. You must make sure that all of these devotees are following the regular principles very nicely. Everyone must rise early, take bath, attend on the large and at least 16 good rounds. Good rounds. 16 good rounds. Not like... Uh, time's short. <laughs> I got it. Squeeze these rounds in. <laughs> no. Sixteen good rounds. See, that's the point. That's why I put that sign up. Only because of that word. Sixteen good rounds. So we have to work on getting our... Increasing the quality of our chanting. And what's the rest of it? He's talking to the temple president. <laughs> so that's, that's Prabhupada's direction. So 16 good rounds. So therefore, unless we do that, we will be, able, we'll be affected by this society around us and the people who are in it. So we have to be in a position where we become strong, that wherever we go, we can bring Krishna consciousness and not be affected by the negativity of the society. Okay, so any questions, comments? Subha? Prabhu? Maharaj, uh, thank you for the class. Uh, one question that I have is, in, this, in the training that we provide, you make it clear that the importance of, of uh, helping the devotees understand uh, how to perform service according to their natural the, propensities, their, their, their varnas. And at the same time, we have to teach Brahminical culture, which one thing that, you know, we see is that regardless of one's propensity, we all learn and be trained in Brahminical culture. We train yeah. to worship the deities, we train to preach, yeah. We train to teach, so all these things are regardless of you know if if one is this propensity or that propensity, which is quite remarkable in one sense. We're talking know. about service of the varnas, mm. just like I'll give you a practical example. Prabhupada established the Gurukul, 
And so he was, wanted the boys to be trained in a Brahminical culture. So there's one report, I think it was from Vrindavan, where one Gurukul teacher, he's the headmaster, he's telling Prabhupada about what the boys are doing. They're getting up at a certain time, they're doing this and doing that. And Prabhupada's adjusting according to what he hears. And then at one point he says, there's one boy, he can't, we can't control him, we can't manage him. He's always causing trouble with the other boys, he doesn't want to learn. Prabhupada said he's not Brahminically, he's, he doesn't have a Brahminical nature. Just take him and put him on the farm and give him some work to do. So, so seeing how people develop through Brahminical training, then you can move people according to how best they are able to, to accept that training. You'll see some people just have this tendency to be in control. That's why they leave. They want to be in... That means there's more of a Kshatriya nature. He has a leadership qualities. Or at least he has that tendency for leadership. So we can... Now, how to set up a system to evaluate? And there's where you have to teach qualities. So in the seventh canto, anybody have a Veda? We have a seventh canto with us, right? Do we have, we have the book over there in the library? Seventh canto, chapter 11. This is the basis of Varnashram. Yeah. Chapter 11 in the seventh canto. Uh, I mean, Prabhupada in Srimad Bhagavatam talks about Vana, about the four Varnas and the four Ashrams in detail in the seventh canto. It's really nicely explained. It's nice to have the book. It's chapter 11 in the seventh canto. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. It's nice to have the Shashvas. Okay, verse number eight, which is actually five verses in one, eight through 12. Here's how you establish, here's the beginning of establishing Vanarshram. Shiva Ram Maharaj has made this verse, his focus in establishing Vanarshram, and it's an amazing verse. Okay, so, these are the general principles to be followed by all human beings. Truthfulness, mercy, austerity, observing fasts on certain days of the month, bathing twice a day, tolerance, discrimination between right and wrong, control of the mind, control of the senses, nonviolence, celibacy, charity, reading of scriptures, simplicity, satisfaction, rendering service to saintly persons, Gradually taking leave of unnecessary engagements, observing the futility of unnecessary activities in human society, remaining silent and grave and avoiding unnecessary talk, considering whether one is the body or the soul, distributing food equally to all living beings, both men and animals, seeing every soul, especially in the human form, as part of the Supreme Lord, Hearing about the activities and instructions given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the shelter of the saintly persons, chanting about these activities and instructions, always remembering these activities and instructions, trying to render service, performing worship, offering obeisances, becoming a servant, becoming a friend, and surrounding one's whole self. O King Yudhisthir, these 30 qualifications must be acquired in the human form of life. So by acquiring these qualifications, one can satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So you'll see there's 21 characteristics and nine, the nine process of bhakti are mentioned. So you mentioned certain things. Yeah, that's included in this verse. So yeah, so, you, so by focusing on these and giving education and training in these, both in the characteristics that need to be developed and at the same time in the activities of devotion service, you have the basis for Ranashram. And then you can establish that. Otherwise, you'll just, you won't be able to 
clearly evaluate a person's nature. Although you can get some tendencies like that. Yes, Mother Vishaka. Any questions about this verse? And I just, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, from, from the description that you gave and also the description in the Shastra, it sounds like Varnashram in modern terminology is a meritocracy. Is a what? Meritocracy. Meritocracy, okay. According to our activities and our qualities, we work in society accordingly. But then there's training that has to be there. Right, but it's not according to birth. No, no. So how does that relate to the position of women in Varnashram? Hmm. Uh, I can think of these, these same qualifications can also be used as a training program for, for both men and women, not just for men. But I mean, as far as Brahminical activities, Chetri activities, Vaishya activities. You mean for as far as valuation of women to, to understand what of their what the woman's nature is? No, to understand what she would do happily in society. Well, according to that evaluation, and the nature is, is somewhat understood, and through the through an educational process, it starts to develop. So you can, we start with Brahminical education, and as we give Brahminical education, we see how people can accept it or not accept it. Then we evaluate those who are not coming up to the standard. Maybe they they also can be trained. And the same, the same thing applies to men and women, not just... But we see that certainly in our society there's restrictions, what women can and cannot do. In terms of? Well, for instance, in India women don't go on the altar. And even no one has recognized women initiating. For initiating. For initiating, yeah. Yeah, well that's, that's there's other factors that have that have been brought into that uh, understanding, which is outside of the Van Ashram. Because without the support system to throw people to women with a great responsibility and not give them the support, just like, you know, the gurus don't have a support system. They're kind of struggling on their own to do whatever they have to do. We're trying to set up a support system. Give ladies that type of situation too, and they can, they'll break. That's why it's one of the reasons why that is not being immediately pushed through, because they feel it'd be too much for that for a woman to have to 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 engage in her own service and to take on the responsibilities of becoming a spiritual master. Well, that, this is a big discussion. I don't know if I want to go into this right now, but that's one point. But the, the point is that there shouldn't be uh, different trainings as far as evaluation for Van Ashram for women and men. The training is the same. The The and what's the word? The, the engagement, how you engage people has to be done by, by persons who are qualified and not just, they also have to be qualified to engage people. And they are the, they are the, the spiritual masters and the temple presidents. So if the leadership is not qualified and you can't really establish that system, Therefore, the first training comes from the le comes to the leadership. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You're not going to just all of a sudden set up the system without the persons who are expert in developing the system and at the same time of helping people come up to that standard. <laughs> Well, that's that's supposed to be the spiritual masters, and that's supposed to be the temple presidents. The temple presidents have a big responsibility, even more than the sannyasis. 
sannyasis travel and preach, but temple presidents also have to be able to take care of the persons that are responsible. And that's a system. Therefore, a temple president, if he tries to do it himself, he may not be able to successfully carry it out unless they have a support system. So one of the problems in our society is that every, we have a good Brahminical emphasis, but we don't have a, an organization to support that. Our organizational level is quite weak. Does that make sense? You can uh, please disagree. I'm not trying to convince you. I just want to see what you, how you respond to what I say. No, it does make sense. But I think there's a very great difference between the theory that we present and the way it's enacted or practiced, unfortunately. Well, how do we get to that? How do we oh. break that dichotomy? First, it begins with hearing. At least we could hear. Hearing? The correct, hearing the correct information. In other words, if it is a meritocracy, women who are qualified to lead should be given facility and encouragement to lead. If it's a meritocracy, then people will be encouraged to take up that leadership. That whoever has leadership qualities, regardless of their gender, would be encouraged to lead. Yeah. But I think in practice, we don't see that. But well, maybe the evaluation system is not there. And people who are also have that quality to, to lead, maybe they still need some education in how, in how to lead properly. I mean, managerial uh, services, organizational services, are different than the material world. The material world, it's easier. You get people working under you, and if they don't come up to the standard, or and then you fire them or you get somebody else. You keep moving things around till you get the ideal system. But here you can't do that, and you have to and you have to take care of the person's spiritual life at the same time, engage them in the in an organizational way that benefits the temple. Mm -hmm that benefits the yatra, that benefits the society. And so then we can't burn people out. We have to be able to move them in such a way that they can be nicely engaged in devotional service. So when you see that certain characteristics are being expressed by a particular type of person, then that can be an opportunity to move that person into that type of service. <laughs> That's meritocracy, right? Please disagree some more. <laughs> you have, you're very much, you have a good insight in how things are going. I'm just a philosopher. You have more p practical understanding than I do. Well, to give a practical example, the GBC recently established a leadership college. Yeah. So if you look at the, um, the people who are teaching and the people who are students mm -hmm. and even the publications, it's male-oriented, to put it rather mildly. But we have so many women who are quali qualified. Right. This is the problem. These women are not being included, which is harmful to the women, it's harmful to the men, and it's harmful to our society, and it's harmful to preaching. So it's a lose, 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 lose scenario. I agree, but there has been a, I mean, you might call it tokenism, I don't know, <laughs> or patronism. You're seeing certain women now who are taking some leadership roles in these areas. I mean, when, I, when we deal with the ILS meetings and we deal with the SGGS, it's all organized by women. Yes? Am I, is that wrong? It may be organized by women, but that does not mean the women are leaders. They're there doing the secretarial work. and uh, yeah. So women uh, who have that propensity are discouraged. They're discouraged. 
I know that personally. Not that I have that propensity, but I've spoken to women who do, and they are definitely discouraged. Hmm. I was thinking we're getting better, but maybe we're not. No, there's one, just to give an example, there's one woman in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Amrita Kaley. Who what was a, that last word? Amrita Kaley. Amr Amrita Kaley. Yeah. So she's very intelligent, uh, very Krishna conscious, and a natural born leader. She applied for this GBC Leadership College. She never received even a response. Not even a response. Not even a response. Do they know her qualifications? <laughs> they didn't bother to inquire. <laughs> hmm. We still have the in club going? Yes. We do, we do have. Yes, unfortunately. Hmm. I'm on the outside. I just see things from my own experiences. I don't know the inner circles and how things work. I mean, I get an idea by the results, but I don't see. But no, Prabhupada wasn't like that. If a person had qualifications, it didn't matter what gender they were, they should be able to fulfill that. Uh, now you have you have a temple president here who is a woman. At least she's in the body of a woman. So what do you do? You think, oh, how can we support her? Not so, how come my good luck, you're in the temple president, we were hoping for you and we're watching you from the sidelines. No, she needs support and she'll try to gather support, but that's not enough. People have to come forward and give support uh, voluntarily so she's not overwhelmed. Because she's a mother and she's a wife. So those two roles are also essential in her life. So sometimes, I don't know, I'm not making excuses. Sometimes people think, you know, women sh can't do it because they have that other role of you know, mother, and so their their time is divided, or for whatever reason. Anyway, I'm not. I'm in favor of equality. <laughs> As far as, re but I'm not equal. There's another type of people. There's a, there's a group of ladies who think that we should be able to do everything. But then again, without the qualifications, that's an, that's that's pre presumptuous, you know. Well, that's why I say meritocracy. Huh? That's why I'm using this term meritocracy. Yeah, meritocracy. Yeah. If you got the merit, then you're should be considered to be one of the, you know, for positions or whatever position like that. All right, thank you for bringing that out. Yeah, just like in this temple, I can tell you the discrimination. The women have to chant in that little section behind Prabhupada, and the men get the rest of the temple all the way up to the deities. Now, how about that, guys? <laughs> you know, she's not supposed to go a little too far because this is off limits over here. Well, of course, we have a division. But I think it could be done a little bit more equally, as far as Japa Pira is concerned. <clears throat> Women are pushed in that little area back there, and they have to sit over there, and they have to kind of walk back and forth over there. And people are walking in the door, disturbs their Japa. So I didn't never like the women's situation as far as the Japa situation here. It is, I'm sorry if I'm managing. Sannyasis are not supposed to manage from Vyasa sons. But since we got the subject going, I just happen to say that. So you can chastise me later. But that's one thing I saw, kind of, you know, the Japa period. The Japa's arrangement is not so good for ladies here. They won't complain. Prabhupada said they won't complain. But 
you can see it's not the same. Maribo. <laughs> Sorry I brought that up. If the women are not happy, the men are not happy, so forget it, guys. That's the truth. If the women are not happy in the temple, the temple will not progress. That's a fact. And I've seen that, and that used to be one of the things I saw here for years, that we really didn't give women what they needed to get in order to practice Krishna consciousness properly, nicely. So, we have to work on these things. We have to work on these things. <laughs> and everyone's sincere, but we don't, sometimes we just don't notice these things. Yes, you have a question? Mm, yes, ma'am. Uh, like, uh, on the same uh, uh, terms as uh, Subhadra Prabhu was asking, like... Slowly. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like, suppose a service is given to us, and it is not our nature, but it is an emergency. Then do it. Then do it. If it's an emergency service, that's fine. We're talking about designated service that you do regularly. <laughs> if it's emergency, then that's, that's a great opportunity to do some needed service. And that takes a little surrender, but you'll definitely get the mercy of the Lord for that. We're talking about, you know, ongoing day-to-day -day services. Mm -hmm. So emergencies are always, emergencies are not a daily affair, but they do come up. <laughs> I know some temples that operate on emergency only. <laughs> But in Chicago, I'm not, I don't think it's like that. It's, it's okay. <laughs> but some temple, it's modern, this is like, oh, this is not getting done. Where is he? Oh, hey, can you do this? <laughs> Where did he go? He's tired <laughs> for some reason. So we don't want that. Mm. Like that. I don't want to get too much into the practical side because it's, then I get into managing and I'm not supposed to manage. <laughs> I always get in trouble when I do that. <laughs> so, okay? That's fine. Okay. So, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavad Ki Jai.